Are you saying that you believe me? The sound of dripping water onto a rock slowly filled my ears as I pulled myself back to consciousness. The next thing that came back was the pain. Running up my back, neck, and shoulders. It was like somebody took a whip to my bare back. What happened to me? Why did I hurt so much and where was I? Where's Zora? I tried to lift my head, then almost screamed as agony ran down my spine and neck. I settled back into whatever I was laying on. After a moment, the pain turned into a dull throb. Finally, I risked opening my eyes to find out where I was. Then, I figured out what was going on. When I did, I was met with a slightly red tint in my sight. Did I hurt my eyes too? Then it came back to me. Mom falling into the gorge. Me trying to save her, then slipping in myself only to grab by Aura. She was trying to pull me up when I saw the Bloodwing trying to attack her. I forced her to let me go to save her life. Mom and I fell into the black abyss of the San Palimo Gorge. How in Luna's holy hell was I still alive? Moving my head slowly to not aggravate whatever was wrong with my neck and back, I saw what happened and I also understood at the same time why I saw the red tint to everything. I was still wearing my goggles and mask. The reason I was still alive, from what I could tell, was because of a large area of stretchy vines surrounding me almost like a spider web. Over me, I saw a hole in the tangle of vines where my body slammed through, slowing my fall until finally stopping me here. Looking up through the hole, I couldn't even make out where the top of the gorge was. Another spike of pain ran through my body and I closed my eyes for a moment. When it passed, I groaned and opened my eyes again. I needed a healing potion at the very least. I had no idea if it would help or what was wrong with me, but I had to do something. I was hurt badly and I had no idea if help was coming. I took a deep breath and tried to use my magic to pull out one from my saddlebags. Nothing happened. My horn didn't even light up or spark. I couldn't even feel the flow of magic coursing through my body. I felt like I was panicking for a moment, thinking I broke something inside myself, making my magic not work, until I remembered Uncle Ori saying something about the gorge messing with unicorn magic. There was also one way I was going to get what I needed out of my saddlebags, but it was going to hurt. I took in a few more deep breaths, then moved my hoof down towards my saddlebags, trying my best not to scream as my body protested, and mostly failing. It took a minute, but finally I felt a bottle and pulled it out. I looked at it to make sure I got what I needed. Well, it wasn't a healing potion, it was a restoration potion. This might be better in the long run. Restoring potions concentrated on the worst parts of an injury rather than affecting the whole body at once. They cost five times as much as a healing potion for that reason alone, and Or always told me to use them sparingly. Well, right now I needed one. I pulled the mask off my muzzle and slowly drank the potion down. Right away I felt the pain in my back and neck fade. It wasn't gone, but I felt like I could move around without too much trouble. Slowly I lifted myself up and looked around. Right away, I saw the ground was only a few feet under me. A stretch of moss, odd-looking plant life, and bare rock met my gaze. There was a small trickle of water running down the middle of the area I was in. I groaned again, then rolled off the bed of vines I was laying on, and fell to the ground. I screamed again when my bruised body hit the ground, then I slowly got back to my hooves and turned on my pip light. My goggles were amazing, and I could see pretty well in most kinds of darkness. But even they had their limits. My light helped cut through the darkness around me. It was then that I remembered the other pony who fell with me. My eyes went wide as I started looking around for Mom. Maybe if I survived the fall, she did too. Grim? I called out to see if she landed somewhere near me. For a moment, all I heard was my own voice echoing off the rocks around me. Then I heard a pained moan, followed by my mother saying, Over here... I turned towards the voice and saw her hanging a few vines away from me, not far from where I landed. Her rear hooves were tangled in the vines and her head was a few inches from the ground. Blood was slowly dripping down from her head near her left eye. I limped closer and asked, You okay? Her eyes opened more. 
I'm alive. That's about all I can say. I can't believe either of us survived that fall. Same here. Let me help you down. I said, reaching up to try and pull her down. Why are you trying to help me? She asked as the vines stretched. I'd tell you it's because you're my mom, and no matter how fucked up your head is right now that I still care about you, but you just say something hurtful or sarcastic. Maybe both. So let's just get that out of here. I'm going to need your help. I said as the vines finally gave and she fell to the ground. She tried to get up, then cursed and sat back down, wincing as she held her rear left leg out at an odd angle. I think I broke my leg, she said, looking up at me. I moved closer to her, then hesitated. I can look it over, but you have to promise you won't try anything. She hissed a little, like she was feeling a rush of pain in her before saying slowly, I'm hurt, lost in a dark gorge, and in a lot of pain. I'm not going to do anything. I need you as much as you need me right now. Please tell me you at least know a little bit about setting a broken leg. Nope, not at all. Or as our medic. I'm just the pony who shoots things or blows shit up. Don't worry, though. I know you have medical training. You can walk me through it. I said as I moved closer to check out her leg. She chuckled a little, then winced in pain again, saying, Great. I ended up with an optimist and a fool. I feel so safe now. Shut up and tell me what I need to feel for. I said, kneeling down to her leg. Fine, but first you're going to have to cut away part of my combat armor. She said. I sighed and said, Not sure how I can do that without my sword. You threw it into that blood wing, then it fell down here with us. I'm sure it landed nearby. See if you can find it. If not, we're going to have to try and get me out of this armor. She said, laying down and breathing slowly. Damn it. I guess she had a point. So I turned to start looking around for the body of the Bloodwing. I moved back towards the vines where I landed and started looking around. The Bloodwing had gone right over me as I fell. Mom fell to my right, so it should be right around. Ah! I jumped back, backing up from the face of a Bloodwing glaring at me. Then I noticed it was hanging upside down, tangled in the vines not far from where I landed. Also, it had misery jammed out of its eye. A little jumpy, are we? Mom asked arrogantly. I took a deep breath and let it out slowly. I fucking hate those things, I said, moving closer and taking hold of the grip as I pulled it out. You know it's dead, right? Mom asked again. I trot back, saying, around Misery's grip. Let's just say coming face to face with a dead bloodwing in the dark is just as fucking scary as finding a live one. Did you find your sword? She asked. Ah, oh, never mind, I guess you did. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to do this without magic, I said as I moved to sit next to her broken leg. Be careful and don't slice my leg off. I still can't believe how sharp that thing is. It's not easy to just stab a bloodwing in the head. And they have thick skulls. Mom said as she moved misery down and slid it under her leg in her combat armor. To be fair, I did hit it in the eye. Also, it's one of Greta's swords. I found it, I said as I used the sharp side to slice the leg of her combat armor wide open. I thought Misery and its sister Joy were lost, Mom said as I pulled Misery back to set it down and then push the sliced up armor over her leg, using my pip light to help me see better. Well, I can say that it's not a compound fracture. I thought that you didn't know anything about medical stuff. Also, where the hell did you find Misery? Do you have Joy, too? Mom asked. I sighed. No, I don't. I found Misery in the absent ruins. I don't know anything about medical stuff, but I do know what a compound fracture is. I did listen to a little of what you tried to teach me as a kid. Not enough, apparently, she said with a grumble. Anyway, talking about weapons isn't going to get us out of here. Use your hoof to check along my leg, see if there's any swollen parts to it. If so, then feel along that area to see if you feel bone under the skin that's separated. Then it's a full break. If you find swelling, but can't feel anything else, then it's a hairline fracture or a bad sprain. 
I followed her instructions. Okay. I found swelling near your fetlock. But I can't feel any separated bone? I think. Mom closed her eyes and did her best to hold back a shot of pain as I checked. When I finished, my hooves pulled away. She took a deep breath and said, It's most likely a hairline fracture, then. In my saddlebags, I have a medkit. She pulled open her own saddle, the buck, and used it to select something. Then she reached into her saddlebags and pulled out a medical kit and gave it to me. I took it, asking, Okay, what do I need to do? Inject the medex into my leg. After that, use the medical brace. That will keep my legs safe so we can start moving, Mom said. I gulped. Okay, let's get started then. It took me about 15 minutes to help Mom get her leg taken care of. Then I had to help her with the nasty cut to her head. Once that was done, she insisted on checking me over too, saying that she couldn't have me passing out because of some internal injury while we moved. As she looked me over, and after I'd removed my own barding, I asked, How are we even going to get out of here anyway? I don't think either of us can climb that far. Also, if we move from this spot, my friends won't be able to find us if they decide to come looking. She put something over my cuts, on my back, as she said, No ponies coming for us, courier. Ow! I said as she applied another something on my back. I know my friends. They'll come looking for me. She sighed. What I mean is, they can't. My brother can't even enter this place without his body vanishing, and your friend, Flyers, can't come down here either, because the gorge has violent updrafts and downdrafts. They wouldn't even have an eighth of the way down here without being slammed into a wall of dying. I looked back at her, wide-eyed. So you're saying we're stuck down here? She sighed, and then got up slowly. I'm saying that if we want to get out, we have to look for a way to do so ourselves. The San Palimo Gorge is huge and deep. Before the war, ponies weren't ever able to explore it. Even now, it's still mostly unexplored. Magic doesn't work here, flyers can't get down here without risking death, and climbing down is just as dangerous because of a good amount of rock here is jagged and sharp. Then how are we going to get out? I mean, there has to be a way. Can't you use your zebra power crap to get us out of here? I asked. No, I can't. She answered solemnly. Why not? I asked. You said it messes with unicorn magic, not zebra magic? She sighed and rubbed her temple, saying, You insist that you're my daughter, and yet you have no idea how my power works. I rolled my eyes. You never taught me about it when I was little. I knew you could do it, but when I asked you how it worked while we were in the stable, you just told me I wouldn't understand until I was older. She cocked her head at me. Huh. To be honest, that does sound like something I would say. I still don't believe you, but... I believe that you believe that I'm your mother. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to why you can't use your power, I said with a wave of my hoof. She sat down, keeping her bad legs stretched out to one side. The best way to explain it is this. Ponies can't use true zebra magic, in all honesty. So-called zebra magic isn't really magic. Then if it's not magic, what is it? I asked, confused. There isn't a word for it in our language. They call it Usha. What Usha does is simple, yet complex at the same time. Zebras have the ability to take power from Equus itself. When tectonic plates shift deep in our planet, it makes an immense amount of power. A trained zebra can take that power and transfer it to an object, like a gem or other items, then force that power to do what they want. Their witch doctors can even pull into the same energy into themselves, making them very powerful. They use that power to change the world around them. To ponies, what they do is magic, but in reality it's not the same thing, she explained. I think I see what you mean. Unicorns like us use energy from our bodies to cast spell. Some unicorns have more energy for magic than others. I remember you teaching me that when I was very young. You said that if energy is used up, the unicorns start to pull power from their life force. I said. She smiled a little. It was odd to see that smile without any hatred in it. 
You're right. That's why a unicorn can die if they use too much power. So, what do you do then? I asked. I've heard you say that you aren't a powerful spellcaster, but I've seen you do amazing things. She looked over at me. I'm not a powerful scalecaster. Most of what I can do are tricks. I know a lot of spells, yes. I can perform thousands of spells, but I don't have a lot of magical energy. And that's why I started looking into the zebras. It took me a year to conclude that no pony could even do what they do. There's something different in a zebra's genetics that makes it impossible. Even a zoni can't use their power. Only a full-blooded zebra with training can. So I found a shortcut. What I do is use my own magic to form the circles needed by zebras to pull the kind of energy I need from Equus. Then I use that to fuel my spells. Doing this, I can perform spells that were impossible for me and many other unicorns. I can also keep doing it far longer than any other unicorn. I nodded in understanding. So without your unicorn magic, you can't do anything? That's right. I can draw the symbols and glyphs. I can even chant the words needed for the zebras to make their power work. But it still won't work, she said with a sigh. I can't believe I'm telling you all this. The drugs must be getting to me. Some of it I heard in your memory orbs, I explained. So those orbs in the bunker were really mine? She asked. I nodded. Yeah, all 37 of them. I just finished watching them when Greed, I mean Thundercracker, showed up. She was quiet for a few moments. Then she looked over at me. If that's true... Tell me one of the worst things you saw, something I believe I wouldn't let anyone know about. I looked over at her and said in a quiet voice, The day you killed Quartz, your father. Her eyes went wide and I saw her shaking a little. My brother didn't tell you about that, did he? Unless you told him everything that happened that night, then I don't see how he could have. He showed up at the end right after you killed your dad. I said in an even quieter voice. Tell me everything you saw in that orb, she said slowly. At first, I wanted to say no, because I didn't even want to think about that night, and I'm sure she didn't either. Then I decided that I'd have to, because from what I could tell, I was getting through to her, finally. Okay, but it won't be easy. I had to relive that moment inside your body, I said. Then I started to tell her everything that had happened. Everything I saw, what I felt, how scared I was by just watching that orb. When I finished, I could see a haunted look in her eyes. I never told Ori what happened that night. I think he knew, but I never told him the whole story. I thought you two told each other everything back then, I said. She shook her head. Some things I never told him. Like how that wasn't the first time my father did that to me. I felt sick at the very thought of any parent doing that to their own child. He... raped you? Kind of. He never fully... you know. But he did come into my room. He would lay with me and run his hooves over my body. Call me his little play. She stopped talking, her eyes tearing up. I don't want to talk about it. Especially with you. In all honesty, I don't think I should hear it. But I'm willing to listen if you ever want to talk. I don't care if you're my enemy or not. No pony should have to go through that alone. Even if it did happen a long time ago. I said. She gave me a look of utter confusion. You know that when we're out of this, I'll most likely try to kill you again, right? Yet you still want to help me. Yes, I do. Deep down, I can tell that you're good. Just misguided. Just like I know that Uncle Ori has a good inside of him, too. You want someone to listen to you, to care about you, even if it's a pathetic unicorn like me, I said with a small smile. I don't feel like I have any good left inside of me. I haven't for a very long time, ever since I lost... Okay, since I thought I lost my daughter, which I still believe that I did. Still, after everything I had to do to try and save my star, I gave everything up I had. I became a monster to fix her, fix the damage I did by letting Aquila out. The lies I told to get where I am. 
and the ponies I helped get more powerful, who would use that power to destroy the world. The more I try to help, the worse I seem to get, she said, wiping her eyes. A wise mare once told me that every pony has good and evil inside of them. Some let darkness take over their light, but they will always have the other part inside of them, no matter how small it is. I said, trying not to tear up. Why is it when your mom cries you instinctively cry with her? Is it something ingrained in genes that makes you empathize no matter how the situation might be? She chuckled a little, then sniffed. Who told you that? I smiled a little. You did. She laughed again. That was a quote from my great-great-grandfather, Dwarf Star's journal. He said that everyone can be saved, no matter how evil they get. Odd thing for an enclave, a unicorn to say, I said. He was referring to Night Stalker. He said that the old Pegasus came to him right before he was banished and asked him for his help to destroy the damage he did to Equestria. Mom said. I never heard anything about that, I said, a little surprised. I never even knew that Night Stalker met Dwarf Star. He did. Many times over the last year he was in the Enclave. My family is one of the few who knows that, though. Well, as in the Guardian. Wait, Dad knows that too? I asked. So, you know Nightshade's the Guardian, then? She asked. Yeah, I remember a week or so ago. I got the memory back when Stryker attacked me and tried to kill Dad. I explained. Wait a minute. Stryker's alive? She asked. I nodded as if it was no big secret. Yeah, he's trying to find and destroy Falling Shadows in Killaquilla? Shit. I had no idea he survived that attack. She said angrily. Wait, how did you know about the attack? I asked. Because I sent word to the Steel Rangers in Baltimore when I found out he was going to try and destroy the tower here after he attacked the Enclave in that area. She replied. Well, somehow he lived. Though he took a lot of burns from whatever happened to him. I said. I don't know why I'm so surprised. That Dick has a knack of surviving the impossible. Just like Nightshade. She said with a sigh. Enough talk. We should really start getting out of here. Courier. Shadow. I said as she got up. She looked back up at me. Pardon me. I got up as well. If we're going to be helping each other right now, stop calling me Courier. Please call me by my name. Shadow. If you do that, I won't call you Mom the whole time we help each other out. I caught a small smile as she said. I can live with that. Shadow. Good. So what's your plan on getting out of here? I asked. She smiled wider. Shadow, are you a pony who likes to gamble? I shook my head. Not so much. That's more Aura and Stardust thing. Why? I told you before that unicorns and flyers can't get down here and climb because it's too dangerous. Well, Steel Rangers love defying the odds. During the time of Elder Tap from the Hidden Sands Rangers, they used to run things all the way out to Las Olacorn. Well, at least close to it. Elder Tap was fascinated by this place and had his rangers set up a base close to the edge of his territory. They were the first ponies to ever build a lift that could make it all the way to the bottom, so they could start at the gorge. When another apple jam took over, the base was abandoned, and Las Olacor never thought it was worth the risk to their own rangers to take it over. So if I'm right, that base should still be there, and no pony would be around. With luck, that lift will still work, and we can use it to get to the top, she said with a grin. Wait, you literally just said this gorge was never explored. How do you know about it, then? I asked. She laughed. I said mostly unexplored. I used to be friends with Elder Applejam, and he told me about it. Elder Apple Slice too, though she said there's no reason to ever go back to it. I know Elder Apple Slice well, and to this day I know she wouldn't send her own ponies down here. Elder Wolfsbane isn't foolish enough either. Um, you do realize that Elder Apple Slice is dead, right? A new mayor named Sapphire Stone runs Hidden Sands now? I asked. She looked utterly shocked. What? The last time I checked, Sapphire was just a paladin. She made Star Paladin over a year ago. I don't know how she got power over a sandstorm and noodle cup, but she did. 
She runs things now. That's why the Rangers have been so active over the past couple weeks, I said, wondering how she could be so out of date with her information. I thought the Enclave kept tabs on everything, large in the wasteland. So, Elder Tap's great-granddaughter took over. If that's true, then we should hurry. If she's anything like him, she'll send ponies there and use it to keep an eye on Las Alicorn, she said, trying to put on her ruined combat armor. Let's get moving, Shadow. We have a few kilometers to walk, and the sooner we get out of here, the better. I sighed and said, If you say so, Grim, we'll lead the way. How much further do we have to go? I asked as we climbed over yet another boulder blocking our path. Over the past ten hours, Mom and I had only gone about a kilometer or so. The gorge was full of pitfalls, irradiated water, plant life we had to cut through with misery, and fallen rocks all blocking our path. Mom was having an even harder time than I was. Her leg wasn't doing so well even with the splint on. She'd already used the other two syringes of Medex she had on her in her medkit, and started needing my small supply of them. If she kept this up, she was risking addiction and her heart giving out because of chems. I'm not sure. We fell in by the old Mattel. The last time I saw the base, it was ten kilometers from there, closer to Las Alicorn. At this pace, it could take us a few days to reach it, she said, breathing heavily from fatigue. I helped her pull her to the top of the boulder, then took a few minutes to rest. If we keep running into these obstacles, I can see what you mean. With how bad your leg is, I don't think we can wait days. She took a moment to lay down as she said, I'll have to manage. Can't you take a healing potion or something? I asked. She shook her head. No. If the break is as bad as I think it is, then I'll risk my leg healing wrong. I need a doctor to set it properly before I can heal it. Maybe we should rest for a while. It seems safe up here? I said, noticing the boulder we were on was big enough for us to set up a small camp. Maybe you're right, she said, getting back up and pulling a bedroll out of her saddlebags. Though I'm worried that if we don't get out of here soon, we'll run out of drinkable water. I don't have much left in my canteen. I have two full ones myself, I said, pulling one out and tossing it to her. I just hope it can get us by. Me too she said, pointing to her saddlebags. I pulled up my Mark II to uh, start seeing if I could get the broadcaster to find anything. I've been trying this for hours now, with no luck. Damn. Still nothing. I'm sure you won't get a signal until we're close to the base. Even the Mark II can't get through the interference down here, she said as she ate a snack cake and drank a little of her water. I did the same and then asked, So why are you being so nice to me? She finished her cake and then said, Because fighting will only slow us down. Simple as that. I want to get out of here, and I need you. Being nice is the only way I can keep us from fighting. I sighed, then laid back in my bedroll. Damn, here I thought it was because you were starting to like me. She laid down as well, saying, Truth be told, as a pony, I don't think you are that bad, Shadow. Just in the past few hours of traveling with you, I can tell you're a smart mare. You like to know things, too, which makes you a bit of a busybody. But you also seem to catch on to things fast, too. If you didn't have that monster inside of you, or had my mark, too, I would find you rather intriguing. I snorted a laugh. Me? Smart? You must have hit your head harder than I thought. I mean it. It's not often you run into a pony who can deal with the things you have and keep her mind intact. I've also seen that you are able to figure out magic and twist it to work for you. I can also see you are thinking all the time, even when you are being spoken to. If you'd had grown up in the Crystal Empire, I'm sure you would have been one of the top students to come out of the magic school there. And that is, if you had some pony to teach you. She explained, making me feel a bit better about some of my dumb decisions I'd made in the past. Still, I doubt it. Most of what I'm able to do is just luck, I said modestly. She shrugged. Maybe a little of it is, but I've seen you figure your way out of things that most ponies can't. 
Hell, you killed some of the sins. You snuck into Mill City Tower and destroyed it. It takes a strong mind to do things that you've done. Thank you. I guess. I said, still surprised at how nice she was being. It was almost like I had my real mother back, but older and speaking to me like an adult rather than a child. She smiled. Don't expect me to keep being so kind when we're out of here, though. I looked down at my hooves, letting my right one slowly run over the polished surface of the Mark II. You're considered a smart mare, right? She cocked her head, looking at me. By most ponies, yes. Then why didn't you just try to talk to me and ask for my help instead of trying to capture or kill me? Especially when you found out who you were, even if you didn't believe me? I asked, letting the question like that, instead of indignant in my head, finally come out. Because I knew you wouldn't work with me. She answered simply. Come on, I yelled. That's a bunch of horse apples. If you really had envy watching me for as long as you did, you know I would have listened to you. At least if you tried to talk to me, that is. So why didn't you just at least sit down and talk instead of trying to capture me? Because I was afraid. Her voice said low and shaky. Afraid of what? I asked. Her voice got quiet. And that there was a small chance that you were telling me the truth. If that was the case, then I couldn't live with myself if I was wrong all this time. That hit me in the gut. So you'd rather risk me hating you or dying just so you'd have to face the fact that you were possibly wrong about something? She looked up at me. Don't you know what it's like to think that someone you loved with all your heart is dead, only to find out that it is a lie? To find out that you have done unspeakable things because of that death and then later found out it was all a lie? She asked. I glared over at her and said, Yeah, I do. Because for the ten years I lived in Stable 28, and a little after, I didn't know anything about my past because you blocked my memories. Even worse, I thought my father was dead. All because you made sure to keep that information from me. So yeah, I do understand. But I was able to push through my pride and anger and make things better. That's why I'm still working with Uncle Ori, even after he killed so many ponies. Even some pony I cared about. He told me that. He said that he was trying to make it up to you for her death. Though I just thought he was letting him. You fool me into thinking he's your uncle, she said. I sighed. And still, you won't believe me about who I say I am. She nodded. I can't believe it. Not unless I have proof. I looked over at her for a long moment, then used my Mark II to find one of the recordings she'd left for me, the one she left with the memory orbs. Then I tossed it to her. Here, listen to that. Maybe once she'll do, you'll stop being so stubborn and start believing me? She picked it up off the ground and asked, What's this? A recording you left for me with three memory orbs. Only my Mark II could decrypt it because you set it up that way. Since I did listen to it, you should be able to now. Listen to it and tell me you still don't believe in the morning. Good night, Grim. I said before turning my back to her. She didn't say anything. I started to close my eyes so I can get a little sleep. After a few minutes, as I was finally faking to sleep, I heard the recording start. Hello, Shadow. I'm glad you were able to get this recording from Lonely Hearts. He really is a good pony. Well, synth. But still, you never know if some pony will do what you ask them to do. Anyway, before I ramble, first off, I hope you're doing okay out there. I know how hard it is to understand how things work in the wasteland, and putting you through all of this breaks my heart. As Mom listens to the recording she left me five years ago with Lonely Hearts, I fell asleep, not even caring if she tried to do something to me while I slept. The next day, Mom didn't say anything to me about the recording, but she started talking to me more about her life when she was young. She also stopped saying things like she can't believe you about who you are, but she still doesn't show any signs of knowing me or believing me either. But I knew that right now she was starting to rethink some things. 
After we got off the boulder and started moving again, the path got a lot easier to travel. Two hours, we managed to get another four kilometers, and I was getting hopeful that we would soon find our way out soon. So Grim, can I ask you something about Dr. Stormy? I asked casually as we walked. She looked over at me as we slowly made our way out of the slope. What about her? Did you two, you know, ever do anything? I asked. She blinked at me, then blushed a little. Why would you ask something like that? Especially since you believe what you do about me. It's kind of a strange question to come out of the blue. Because I saw you two sleeping in the same bed a week after Stryker left you in an orb. I said, as I moved around a jagged rock sticking out of the ground. Mom following closer to me, since I could see better in this gloom because of my goggles. Her pip light was on, just like mine, but it only helped so much. I don't see how that's any of your business, she said. I stopped and looked back at her. You did! Her jaw dropped open. I, I, you don't know anything. And here I thought you were only into stallions, I teased. I am, she exclaimed. Stop putting words into my muzzle. And why are you blushing? I teased again. I, I am not. My leg just hurts right now and the medex is making my body hot, she said with a huff. Sure it is. I spill it, I said. Do you do this to your friends? Ask them who they did or didn't sleep around with? Mom asked. All the time, I said with a laugh. Hell, they bug me about sleeping with Aura. Then I usually make fun of Cookie Bite for secretly liking Wingnut. I still can't figure out why you like a griffin. That's so weird, she remarked. Don't change the subject to the kinky and hot relationship I have with a badass griffin. I can already tell you you did something with her apart from the one kiss she gave you in the clouds. I teased again. You're impossible, she yelled, pushing past me. I'm not talking with you about this. Okay, fine, have it your way. I'll just have to let my imagination go wild, I said as I followed her. A few minutes passed and the landscape flattened out. Then we walked, started getting easier again. Finally, she said, I didn't sleep with her in the way you're thinking, okay? Just one night, I drank a lot. I had been out with Stormy and Nightshade. I interrupted. The first night you ever two went out? Yes. Now stop interrupting me, or I'm not saying anything, even if you do assume the worst. She said. I giggled. Okay. She sighed again and continued. Anyway, I was so drunk that I couldn't tell up from down or what color my bed sheets were. Nightshade and Stormy had to carry me home. As was natural back then. I started crying over Stryker again, and Stormy came to comfort me. A couple hours later, when Stormy fell asleep, I started thinking to myself that maybe I should let Stormy have her way. Finally, because at least I knew she loved me. So I... Mom stopped and blushed harder. So I started kissing her belly and other areas. Honestly, I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never been with a male or ever wanted to be. No way. So you mean you went down on Stormy? Bet she liked that when she woke up, I said. I tried to. Even managed to find the right spot through my drunken haze. Stormy woke up and she wasn't happy. Not at all. She pushed me off her and I tried to kiss her on the muzzle, saying that I wanted her. Mom elaborated. I stopped for a moment. Wait, Stormy made you stop? She nodded. She did. Then she slapped me and forced me to look her in the eyes. Once I was able to stop crying and begging her to just let me do it, she said this to me. I love you, Grim, but I'm not going to let you do this while you're too drunk to think straight. If I was ever lucky enough for you to fall for me, I don't want it to happen when you're drunk. Now go to sleep, and if you feel the same when you're sober, we can talk. And only talk. Then she got out of bed and went to her own room. Wow. Is all I could say to that. Stormy was a good friend. She knew that I would have hated myself the next day. 
I know that deep down she would have loved to be with me even for one night. But she also would have hated herself for letting me do it. She explained. What'd she do when you sobered up? I asked. She made me call Nightshade and ask him to go out for a walk with me. She knew I needed some pony more than her. Honestly, she was the reason I later married him. She replied. I felt a twist in my heart as she told me the story. Because I took away that wonderful friend. Sometimes I find it hard to believe that she's the same mare who started the Devil's Children program. What that program became wasn't Stormy wanted. When she came up with the idea, Mom said. I looked back at her, confused. Really? She nodded. Don't get me wrong. The way the fools were raised and all is what she wanted and she planned. But she didn't like the isolation from the Enclave. She never wanted them put into a stable or taken from their parents. She wanted to give orphans a purpose in life. Then why did the program end up in Stable 97? I asked. Some pony in Stratus made the council decide to put it there. They chose to kill the inhabitants. They wanted fools from certain families taken and forced Stormy to run the whole thing. If she didn't, she would have been kicked out of the Enclave. So Stormy did, as she always has. She treated it like a job and did what she had to do. She let herself sink into her work and ignored the moral wrongs with that place. Mom said, looking around a curve in the path before walking around it. So she wasn't that bad of a pony, I said. She was, but only because she let herself be like that. Though I'm sure deep down she hated what she was doing, Mom explained. Who was the pony who made the council do that? I asked. She shrugged. No idea. Though I'm sure Nightshade has an idea of who it was. Ever since he found out about the program, he worked to stop it. How did he find out about it? From Stormy? I asked. No. His father led the Pegasi who invaded Stable 97. She replied. That caught me off guard. You mean Nightshade's dad was the one who attacked that stable? Yes, he was a horrible stallion. Loved fighting and killing lesser races, Mom said. I wasn't sad to hear about his death, but his mother, that hurt almost as much as losing Stryker. We walked in silence for a little while after that. Finally, I asked her, You're rather talkative about your past. Why is that? She didn't respond right away, and when she did, her answer came out slowly, like she was thinking carefully on how she answered. I'm not sure. Maybe because you seem to know a lot about my past already, so there's no need to hide it from you. I could also be that no pony has asked me about my past for a long time. At least not someone who cared about what I had to say. Also, for some reason, I found it easy to talk to you. Blood calls to blood, I said as we came to a small pool of water. Both of us stopped and looked down at it. The pool was so still. It was like some pony placed a large mirror on the ground. Then, the lights from our pit bucks hit the pool. It reflected back, uh, small diamonds like crystals lit up all over the rocks around us. Both of us looked in awe as we found ourselves in an area of artificial stars. It's beautiful. Mom nodded, saying, Yes. Yes, it is. It almost reminds me of being back up in Nimbus during the new moon. Both of us sat down and just looked up at the twinkling lights. After some time passed, I said, If I never got sick and grew up in the Crystal Empire, I would have been able to go up to Nimbus and steal a rare thing, too. I wish I would have been able to do that. I really do. I heard Mom sniff and looked over at her. My jaw almost dropped open as I saw tears running down her face. Her face screwed up in utter sadness as she looked up into the lights. She noticed me looking at her. Then she turned to dry her eyes as she said, I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. I shouldn't have said anything about the Crystal Empire, or who I know or believe I am, I said, looking away. Shadow, I know you believe you're my daughter. From what I heard in that message, it would make it seem that you are. I'm having a hard time believing it, as you know. I still don't want to believe it, she said, still choking a bit. I get it, because you know deep down that your little star couldn't have grown up to be a mare like me. I said with a sigh. There it is. But 
now that I have had time to calm down from my anger at you and get to know you, I realize that I'm not the same mare I was when I was young either. I forgot that the wasteland can change a pony. For the past few months, I've let my anger and sorrow control me because of that. I've been very stubborn, she said. I looked back over at her. Are you saying that you believe me? She chuckled a little. <laughs> Heavens no. But I also can't rule out the possibility that you might be who you say you are. I guess what I'm trying to say is, if I can find a way to prove it was true, then I'll believe you. I felt a tear run down my own face as I said. It's a lot better than I was expecting, and I may have just a thing to show you who I am. When we get out of here, then tell me. For now, let's get moving. As much as I'd love to look up the beauty of this cavern, we can't stay here forever. She said as we got up and we were on our way again. A couple more hours passed without a word uttered between us. We traveled another couple of kilometers, and I had a feeling that we were getting close to wherever this steel ranger lift was. For the past hour and a half, Mom kept a few meters in front of me, using her pip light to illuminate the way. As she did, she'd been humming the same tune to herself. Finally, I broke the silence between us. What's that tune you're humming? It sounds sad, I asked. She stopped her humming, looking back at me. It's a song from the farm ponies in the Crystal Empire used to sing. It's a sad song, but also has a lot of endearment. Oh, it just sounded so familiar, I said. She smiled a little. The Enclave outlawed it fifty years ago, said it gave ponies ideas of rebellion, Though I'm not sure why. Even though it's outlawed, you'd still hear it from time to time if you lived near the wall, like I did. Would you like to hear it? Sure, I said. Not really sure I did, but it was better than her not talking. She took a moment to recite. My love, my love, remember the cries when winter died for spring skies. They roared and roared, but we grabbed our seed, and sowed a song against their greed. And down in the vale, hear the reaper pony swing, the reaper pony swing. Down in the vale, hear the reaper pony sing, a tale of winter done. My fold, my filly, remember our chains, when King Sombra ruled with iron reins. We roared and roared and twisted and screamed, for ours a vale of better dreams. She finished, and blushed a little. I guess it's more of a poem than a song, but I've always liked it. It's beautiful. What does it mean? Why would they be outlawed? I asked. The meaning is in the words themselves. The Enclave ruled Pegasi all over other races of pony kinds, just like King Sombra did. No matter how much you try, you can't ever be as high up the soul ranks as a Pegasus. The ponies who live there, where I grew up, are seen as only for labor and not much else. They were spat on and laughed at because, to them, we meant nothing. You can feel the reaper pony, or death, nibbling at your hooves with every day that passes. At times you'd wish that death would just come and take you away from the life you have. Some ponies see that song as a call to stand up to the way life is in the Enclave, and to change it, she said. I think I can understand. It was bad as a life I had growing up where you did in the Crystal Empire. The Wasteland is still worse, I said. In most ways, yes. But at the same time, it's not. The Wasteland is scary and dangerous, yes. But a pony can still be free out here, Mom responded. Yeah, but you don't run into raiders or slavers. She smiled knowingly. True. But still, at least there's a chance. The Enclave may seem like it's an easy life to ponies who didn't grow up there, but in reality, it's a prison to pony kind. Then why'd you go back if it's so bad? She smiled and looked back at me again. Whoever said I truly went back? I thought of all ponies you would have figured it out. I don't care that what the Enclave or any pony thinks. No, the only pony I truly follow is the director. Who is she, anyway? I asked as we came to a sharp bend in the path again. Mom stopped quickly, saying, Shh! Huh? Why? 
I asked softly. She rounded on me, saying quietly, I mean it. Shh. I see lights coming from another corner. Slowly, I peeked around the corner as well and saw a dim light coming from down a skinny cavern and around another bend. Why would there be light all the way down here? I asked. Mom checked her pit buck, then looked back at me. The only explanation I can think of is that we're close to the base. And that's what it looks like from my map. But what I don't understand is why the lights are down here at all. The base had been abandoned for 30 years. Well, we aren't going to find anything out if we just sit around here, I said, pushing past her and heading down a small space. We don't know if any ponies down here. What? We need to come up with a plan before we do anything rash, Mom said, putting a hoof on my shoulder. I pulled away with a small chuckle. Plans are stupid and normally lead to something bad, so we're going to risk it. Shadow, you can't be serious. Do you know how stupid that sounds? She asked. I just smiled like a crazy mare at her. Yep, now let's go. I moved the rest of the way down the hall as Mom tried to keep up. I got to the other corner and rounded it quickly to find nothing. Well, not nothing per se, but no point in town in the well small lit cavern. Huge industrial lights were set into the cavernous opening, filling the space with bright white light. So bright, in fact, that I had to remove my goggles. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust, but when they did, I was sure we found what we were looking for. Set against the wall between the two lights were rails for some kind of lift. A terminal was set into a metal platform just at the end of it. Walking closer, Mom said, Shut up, Shadow. I couldn't help but grin as she walked past. Why? Because I was right. She started typing at the terminal, saying, We still haven't gotten out to the base yet. Sure, but she said it was abandoned. I'm sure we're fine. I said as I trod over to her, looking around the cavern to make sure no pony was around. It was fun to tease Mom for her paranoia, but that didn't mean that no pony was around. If this place was abandoned, then the lights wouldn't still be working. Mom said she continued to work on the terminal. Why not? My stable has a lot more power, and they ran for 200 years, and are still going strong. I said. Stables use magic generators, and have a complicated system to keep them going. It's one reason stables need to have ponies to maintain them. The Steel Rangers haven't been here in 30 years. That means 30 years of no pony fixing and maintaining the power systems here. Mom said. If that's the case, then how did you expect the lift to get us up there? I asked. She sighed. There's a separate power source that can run this lift. I have a few gems in my bag that can be used to make some work, but we won't need that because the base is working again. I just hope that there's some wastelanders up there who took the place over while the Steel Rangers were away. I cocked my head. How are wastelanders any better than the Steel Rangers? We'll be breaking into their home to get out. I'm sure they won't like it much. Wastelanders are a lot easier to deal with than steel rangers, Mom said. Then she hit the side of the terminal with a hoof. Damned thing. Wait a sec. We aren't going to just go up there and kill random ponies, I said. She turned and looked at me. Why not? They'll just be in our way, and I don't feel like dealing with ponies who get in my way. You should know that by now. I pushed her away from the terminal. No, we aren't going to just go up there and start shooting or killing ponies. We can talk to them first. We'll only attack if they give us a reason to. She was glaring at me. Is that your plan, Courier? You know that if they're raiders or fiends, they'll shoot first and not care who you are. Oh, so it's Courier again? Guess your nice side decided to go on vacation. I said angrily. I just want out of this place. I don't like being without my magic for this long she exclaimed. I snorted. Even when we get up there, Mom, you still have a magic blocking ring on, or have you forgotten that technically you're my prisoner? She looked ready to hit me, then she closed her eyes and took a deep breath. Fine. I'm not really in the mood for this, and you're right. Forgive me, Shadow. Oh, look, Grim's back. Nice to see you again, I said, turning towards the terminal. So what's the problem with this? No, oh, shut up, Mom said, coming closer to stand to me. I can't seem to hack past the terminal security. Hmm, 
guess we're lucky I'm here, huh? I said, connecting the Mark II to the terminal. The Mark II didn't even ask me to do anything. They just unlocked the terminal. Huh, I guess the security on this thing wasn't that bad. Mom just rolled her eyes. Whatever, get a weapon ready and let's get up here. Get your broadcaster ready. Once we're in the base, you should be able to call for backup. Um, where's the lift? I asked. And who am I going to call? My friends don't have pit bucks, broadcasters, or a radio. She pushed a button next to the lift, and from far above, I heard a bang of a grinding sound echoing down to us. The lift is up there. We need to wait for it. As for who to call, I don't know. I know you won't call my team, even though they would be a big help at the moment. So, I hope you know somebody else who can find your friends. I took a few minutes to think about it, as the lift slowly came down the rails. When it came to a halt in front of us, I stepped onto with Mom as I thought about who I could call that would be able to help find my friends. Mom hit a switch on the platform itself, and with a shudder, it started slowly going up. And then it came to me. There was one pony who could help us. Do you know what channel the Enclave uses? I asked. I know a few of them. Why? She asked. Because I need to call Nightshade, I said. Her eyes got wide, and she said, no. Grim, we need help. He's the only pony who can get them out fast enough. I argued. Shadow, I can't have him find me. He wants me dead. She said, sounding scared. No, he wants to help you get better. He still loves you. I said. Now tell me which channel I can use to get a hold of him. She looked away. I can't believe that. I just can't. If he did, he wouldn't have stayed behind. He would have hunted me down for so many years trying to stop me from completing my mission. The lift was halfway up, as I said. Fine, I'll just broadcast to every Enclave channel until I find him. I'm sure that'd be more dangerous than just talking to Nightshade. I started to lift my pit buck, then Mom said, Fine, but promise me he won't do anything to me. I'm not going to let him hurt you. You have my word, I said. She took a deep breath and then said, the broadcast channel, the one you need, is the one for High Council Ponies Chambers. It's Skyforce Gamma 888797. Your pit buck should be strong enough to find it. We're almost at the top now. I can see the edge of the gorge getting close, along with a small metal building that hung slightly over the edge. I looked back at my pit buck's broadcaster channels. Military channel 388 Beta, Military Channel 299-45-78 Alpha, MAS-EBS-39, EMB Stratus-8332, EMB Stratus-9934. I'm not seeing it, I said. She looked over at my pit buck. It's a hidden broadcast. Normally other broadcasters with the proper coding can find them. Your pit buck, however, can find them. You just need to do this. She filled with an option I never saw before. When she clicked it, two more stations showed up. Emergency Enclave Officer Broadcast Channel Alpha Code. Skyforce Gamma 888-797. Holy shit. I had no idea there were hidden channels on the broadcast system. What's the first one? I asked. It's direct access to the officers in Stratus. Now hurry up and call Nightshade before I lose my nerve to let you. She replied. The lift came to a stop in front of two massive doors. As it did, I clicked the channel Mom told me to about it and said into it, Does any pony read me? This is Courier Shadowstar. It took only a second for Dad's voice to echo out from my pit buck. Shadow, you're alive! I'm guessing you heard from my friends? I said. I was monitoring you when you fell into the gorge. I'm with your friends. He was cut off by the sound of someone ripping the broadcaster away from him. Shadow, are you okay? Where are you? Is that bitch still with you? Aura yelled in the broadcaster. I'm fine. Mom's fine too. We've been working together to get out of the gorge. I replied. I'm coming to get you. Where are you at? She asked. I heard shuffling and a protest from Aura until Dad got the receiver back and said into the broadcaster, we're a couple of kilometers north of where you fell in. 
Are you still in the gorge? No, not really. We just used a lift that the Steel Rangers built a long time ago. I said, and then Dad cut me off. You're at the old base? The one connected to the gorge? He asked. Yeah, it was the only way to get out. Fuck. Dad shouted. We're on our way. We're only a few kilometers away. Shadow, you and your mother need to get out of there. The Steel Rangers... As he spoke, the doors to the base opened, and two Steel Rangers in full power armor stepped out, pointing huge guns at Mom and I. I slowly lowered my pit buck, saying, Yeah, I noticed. Hope we can get here soon. Good luck. Then I cut off the broadcaster. Don't move. You're trespassing on property of the Hidden Steel Rangers. A voice I hadn't heard in a long time said from inside the base. Then another than Watts floated out behind the two Steel Rangers, aiming a flamethrower at me. Mom was shaking as she looked at the two Rangers and the Mr. Gutsy. I started to laugh. Hey, Watts! Long time no see! Wait a moment. You know that robot! Mom asked. Watts floated out more as one of the Rangers asked. How did you get onto our lift? Miss Shadowstar? Do my old cameras deceive me? By Celestia, it is you! He said, floating over to me and lowering his flamethrower arms and saying to the others, Stand down, knights! This is the courier herself! Huzzah! Watts, she's not one of us, and she wanted for crimes against the Steel Rangers, the other ranger said. Watts turned around and looked at them both. That is incorrect, Knight Sprinkles. She attacked Elder Wolfsbane, chapter of the Steel Rangers, after she was attacked by them. Both rangers didn't back down. The first one who spoke before, a mare, said, She's being blamed for killing Sentinel Box Tape Watts. Now stand down before I have Scribe Hazel power you down. That got me. I pulled out my sword and held it to my muzzle. I could feel my horn starting to get his magic back, now that we were outside the gorge, but it was still weak. Oh, fuck both of you. I had nothing to do with the death of Box Tape. That was Wolfsbane. The mare turned towards me, yelled. Oh, yeah? Sure. Coming from a pony who blew up Appleton and an enclave tower. Now, drop your weapon before I blow off your head, courier. Big words for a pony who follows a mare like Sapphire. She killed your last elder. Did you know that? I asked. How dare you say something so despicable about our elder? The stallion yelled. Fuck both of them. I started to move, lifting misery in my muzzle when Hazel stepped out, yelling, All of you stand down! I did, and same for the two rangers. Mom didn't even move. She looked like she was ready to bolt. The mayor looked back at her, saying, Ma'am, she's wanted for crimes against. I know, but we also don't really know who killed Box Tape. Now stand down so we can all talk like ponies, not raiders, Hazel said. Then she looked over at Mom and I. Long time no see, Grim. Glad to see you're still alive. Mom was looking at the cute orange mare for a moment before she said, Junior Scribe Hazel? Senior Scribe now, Hazel said before looking back at me. Hey, Shadow, why don't you come inside and we can talk? I promise that we won't do anything to you, and you can leave as soon as we get some answers. Hazel, why should I trust you? I said, still holding on to misery. She smiled. Because I have had no reason to lie to you. If I was your enemy, I would just kill you. I looked back at Mom, then at Hazel. Okay, but I'm not giving you my weapons. She chuckled. Fine with me. So, it's as Elder Sapphire thought. Wolfsbane was the one who killed Box Tape. Hazel said as we sat at a small table near the front of the base. I just finished telling her about the attack on Cartwheel and how Box Tape died. Also about what happened with the Red Talons and how he ended up in the Groge. Mom, throwing in a little here and there. So far, Hazel hadn't said a word about my Mark II, why Apple Slice died, or the filly I knew they were looking for. She just told her two nights to wait for her in the other room with Watts, and oddly enough, Glimmershot, from my old stable. 
I got a quick look at the former security mayor before I was shuffled into this room. The red talons helped us after Cartwheel fell. And then a week later, they fell because of the unchained talons. I said, I had nothing to do with Box Tape's death. He was like a grandfather to me. We figured as much, but Sapphire wasn't sure after what she'd been hearing about you as of late. Word reached us not long ago about what happened to the Twin Cities. It was hard to believe that you did that, Hazel said. Yes, I was quite surprised by that, too, Mom said. I knew she was crazy, but not in that crazy. I huffed. I thought the griffin I loved was killed by one of them, so I lost it a little. I feel bad for it, at least. Smooth, Mom said, rolling her eyes. Hazel just looked at me for a moment, then decided that whatever she was going to say wasn't worth it. She looked back at Mom. So, I see you found Shadow Grim. I guess the rumors about you working with the Enclave weren't true, then. I'm glad to see you're still in one piece and reunited with your daughter at last. Yeah, sure, my daughter, Mom said sarcastically. Hazel looked confused, so I threw in. She doesn't remember me at all, Hazel. It's a long story. She looked sad. I can understand. I mean, you don't look anything like Morningstar. I didn't even know who you were, really, until after Stable 28. Sapphire told me who your mother was on the way back from that. I sighed and said, Still, it doesn't matter right now. I'm glad you didn't let your knight shoot us and all, Hazel, but really, I don't have time here to sit and talk. My friends are on the way right now, and I think I'm in danger since you're here. She looked confused again. Why would you be in danger? You've always been friends with the Steel Rangers. I'm not so sure now, I said as Mom leaned back in her seat, ignoring us. That's what I don't understand. You said to my knights that Elder Sapphire killed our former elder? That's a big accusation to make, she said. I found her body along with her guards outside of Cartwheel just before the attack. She'd been dead for a week and her body was hung from a rock with traitor carved into her body. I would have thought Wolfsbane did it, but... When I broke into his terminal, he left notes saying he couldn't find her and was worried something happened to Elder Applesize. It's also strange that the youngest star paladin took over as Elder when... Uh, then kicked Sandstorm out. I said... Normally, yes, but Sandstorm wasn't a good choice to take over. Star Paladin Noodle Cup backed Sapphire, saying they needed young blood to take over. They all got behind her when she took charge when Apple Slice didn't come back. She's not a bad pony shadow. I couldn't see her hurting Apple Slice. She looked up to the former elder, Hazel said. When I knew Sapphire, she was always a mad trying to work her way up the ranks as quick as she could, Mom said, almost as an afterthought. I sighed. Either way, I don't trust her. Not until I find out why she's hunting the other Mark II and what she had to do with Elder Apple Slice's death. Maybe you should talk to her before you jump to conclusions, Shadow, Hazel said. I would if I could, I said, getting to my hooves. It was nice to see you again, Hazel, but I've got to be going. She sighed, then got to her hooves, too. I understand. I still wish you'd stay for a little while. I wish I could. But I need to get back to my friends before they come here trying to kill every pony, and I have to get to Los Holocorn. I said, trying to turn for the door. Why Los Holocorn? Do you know what that place is like? Hazel asked with a worried tone. Wolfsbane will kill you, Shadow. We all know what you did to his eye. I know that. What I'm getting into, and it wasn't me that did it to him. That was his father. I said, then turned and... Headed for the hallway that led out of the room. Grim, don't run off. I need to use the restroom quick, and we can go. If you run, you'll never get that horn ring off. She just rolled her eyes. I don't plan on going anywhere. Honestly, I'm curious to see what you have planned next, Shadow. I just nodded, then headed for the math rooms. When I was inside, I locked the door, turning on the faucet, then looking at myself in the mirror. I looked over my haggard experience, took in the patches of white mixed into my black coat and the black silver streaks over my silver mane and the burning fire in my eyes. As I looked at myself, I said quietly, give me two more days, just two more days. Ever since I got out of the gorge, my head started pounding. I started feeling it coming over me, almost like some pony else was under my coat. 
I felt hot and weak. My sight was slightly blurred every time I moved. It felt like I was walking through mud. As I looked myself over and washed my face, looking back in the mirror, I saw Aquila's reflection instead of my own. I've waited so long, Shadow. You only have a few hours left. A day at most. I'm not giving you any more time. I'm sick of this game. I just kept looking at her reflection and screamed, Get out of my head! Then I started to slam my head into the mirror. Once, twice, three times until I felt blood flowing down my face. I slammed my head into it again and again and again. It just made my head feel worse. I started to cry as I fell to the ground and curled up into a ball. Oh, there's no need to cry, Shadow Star. Soon this'll all be over, Aquila said. Also, slamming your head into the wall won't stop me. It'll just hurt you. Any damage you do to yourself, I can fix later. Tick-tock, Shadow. That's the sound of your life coming to an end. For a moment longer, I just sat there, curled up into a ball as my tears flowed. I wasn't going to make it to Los Alicorn. I was hoping this whole time that I'd get Mom to believe me and she could fix me like she said in her notes. Aquila knew that. She wasn't going to let me go when she was so close to what she wanted. I knew what I had to do. Aquila might take over, but I could still use Mom to help me. So I turned the water off, pulled out a healing potion, and drank it down. I looked myself over again in what was left of the shattered mirror, seeing myself once again. A little glass was still stuck in my scalp, so I pulled it out, cleaned the blood, and then headed to the door. Mom was waiting for me in the hallway, looking at the far wall. How much time do you have left? I wasn't surprised by her question. She knew what Aquila was as much as I did, maybe more. Not long. She rolled her eyes. Be specific. A few hours, maybe a day, I said. When she looked back at me, I saw something in her eyes I thought I'd never see. She looked at me with sympathy, saying, You've been trying to get me to believe you about who you are, so I'd help you, am I right? Part of it, yes, I replied. She sighed. I still don't know what to think, but I do know that something has to be done with Aquila. A tear fell from my eye as I said quietly, I just want my mom back. I felt her put a hoof on my shoulder. Looking up, I saw her looking down at me. I'm sorry I can't give you that. I'm sorry I can't believe you yet. But after you helped me down there, I owe you my life. Tell me what you need and I'll help. I felt a few more tears fall as I asked, Really? She nodded. Yeah. Maybe you're right, and all I need to do is just try and talk to you instead of trying to kill you. I just hope that once I help you, you can help me. I knew what she wanted me to help with. She wanted to activate Falling Shadows. At this point, I didn't know what choice was worse. Help Mom activate a super weapon after what I've seen she's capable of, or letting Aquila get out. In the end, I knew I only had one choice to make. Help me get Aquila out of me, and I'll help you with Falling Shadows. I'm not giving you my pip buck but I'll use it how you want me to. She smiled. Good. Then I'll need to get back to the Ministry as quick as I can. If you let me go, I can teleport there and get what I need. Wait. You have something to pull Aquila out of me? I asked, surprised. She smiled. You could say that. If I hurry, I can be back in three hours or so. Do you think you can hold out that long? Maybe if it'll help. My friends and I will keep... Heading towards Los Alicorn. We can meet in the middle. Good idea, Mom said. So, do we have a deal? I sighed, and knowing I was risking a lot doing this, I reached up and used a gem that Solstice gave me to unlock her horn. It clicked, and I pulled it off her horn. Maybe better if I came with you? She shook her head. Aquila is almost ready to take over. The more magic you use, the quicker she'll get what she wants. I'll meet you on your way to Los Alicorn. If you all make it to the mountains before I do, I'll meet you in Pioneer's Pass. Your griffin friend should know that place. We both walked out of the base, closely watched by the two knights from before. As we did, I reached into my saddlebags and pulled out the three memory orbs I had Wingnut grab for me. Here, I want you to have these. They should prove what I'm saying is true. Once I'm better, I'd like you to watch them. 
She looked at them as she took them and asked me, Whose are these? I smiled. They're yours. Now watch them and you'll understand once I'm better. Now, get out of here before my friends show up. She smiled a little, then put them in her saddlebags. Thanks. I'll do that. Also, thanks again for taking the time to talk with me and save my life. I'm sorry about everything that had happened. And that is, if you can prove what you're saying is true. If I find out this is one big lie, I'll kill you. Before I could say anything else, she vanished in a flash of blue light. I sighed to myself. Have I made the right choice? I turned away from the base and looked to the east. I could see the sky carriage in the distance along with my friends. I did my best to smile and start to trot towards them. I had a feeling it was going to take a lot of explaining to explain to them what happened. It took over an hour to explain what happened when I fell into the gorge with Mom, how we got out, and why I kind of let her go. I didn't tell them how close Aquila was to breaking out. I just told them that she could help me and that I was trusting her to do so. All of them were pissed for letting me, letting her go, and for saying that I'd help with falling shadows. As we argued, we were flying towards the place Mom said we should meet in a few hours. Dad was just as pissed as the rest of them for the risk I took. After everyone calmed down, Aura was holding me close in the sky carriage, as they told me about what happened when I was gone. From the sound of it, Windthrasher was able to hold off the blood wings while my friends escaped further down the gorge. Once they knew they were going to be okay, they started trying to find a way down, but just as Mom said, none of them could do it. Dad showed up not long after that in his star ranger gear, but even he couldn't tell. For most of the past day, they all tried to come up with terms with the fact that I was most likely dead. We were getting ready to go back to New Pegasus when you came to call in. Dad said was his mask pulled off. He was sitting across from this carriage from me, while Aura held me close. We were almost to the location Mom told me about now, and all I wanted to do was curl up with Aura and hold her just as tightly as she was holding me right now. I'm sorry I scared you all so much. Yeah, I did what you had to do to save me, Shadow. We all understand. Aura said, kissing my head and then nuzzling my mane. She'd been doing this ever since she saw me again. She wasn't even mad at me after a few minutes. Sure, that's the reason. Windthrasher murdered angrily. She'd been cold towards me ever since she first saw me. My friends couldn't understand her anger, but I did. She thought I tried to kill myself. She wasn't going to believe me about why I let myself fall. Not for a while. Windthrasher, why else would she have done that? Stardust asked from where he was hooked up to the sky carriage. Why don't you ask Shadow? Windthrasher snapped. My dad looked back at me. Same for Aura. What does she mean? It doesn't matter. Everything will be fine in a couple of hours. I said, glaring at Windthrasher. Right, Windthrasher? She glared right back at me. It'll only be better when she stopped lying to every pony. I was about to say something back to her when Stardust said, Let's not fight now, please. Shadow's safe, and we might... He hesitated before continuing to speak. Might have a way to fix her. Let's just get this through tonight. And when she's better, we can all fight over whatever we want. And whatever has Windthrasher's tail in such a twist. My uncle was sitting on the other side from Dad. He'd been quiet for a whole time. Finally, he looked over and said, Star, you're not looking so good. What's wrong? I'm just tired, I said. He looked like he wanted to say more, but Stardust said, We're here. I'm going to land in a spot where we can camp. Dad looked over at Ori Callus as Stardust started to land. I'm still confused as why she trusts you, Ori Callus. In all rights, you should be dead. Oh, don't start, Dad. If you two start fighting, I'm sending you home, I said. He looked a little ashamed of himself. I'm sorry, sweetie. I just can't trust that traitor. It's okay, I said as we landed. Let's set up camp and eat. For the rest of the day, let's just forget about our problems and just enjoy each other's company. Finally, Windthrusher smiled a little. That's fair. Agreed, said Dad. Works for me, Lori Callis added. I smiled, looking at my small family. Thank you. 
I took a half hour to set up and eat. Once we were finally full and happy sitting around on a small fire, I looked over at them all and said, Since Mom's not here yet, I have an idea. Let's all tell a story about one of our happiest memories or a dream we all had when this is over. I was once again lying against Dora. Her talons wrapped around me as I rested. She leaned back, saying, mm -hmm. You know what? That's a good idea. With all the bad shit we've been dealing with, it'd be nice to talk about something cheerful. Dad smiled, saying, I'll start. My happiest memory was the day Shadow was born. Stardust laughed. Come on, old buck, that's too easy. I'm serious. I mean, I've had a lot of happy memories in my life, but nothing about as happy as the day Grimm had Shadow, he said. For a while there, you didn't even know if you'd be a father, Nightshade, Oricala said. Windthrusher's eyes went wide at that. Really? Dad nodded. Yes. Grimm was pregnant twice before Shadow came along. The first foal we lost just into Grimm's second trimester. The second into her first trimester. Grimm and I almost gave up on even trying and even started looking into adoption. It took me three months to get Grimm to listen to me about the idea. Then we got pregnant again. For the first few months, we didn't even try hoping that this one would make it to term. Then Shadow came into our lives. A beautiful filly. A fool that felt like a miracle to us both. I was surprised that she had red eyes, Orikala said with a laugh. I asked Grimm if you were really the father. Dad gave my uncle a flat look, then said, Yes, I know. She told me about that. Looking over at my dad, I asked, What does me having red eyes have to do with you not being my dad? He chuckled. It's because you're the first foal in our family to not have green eyes. Oricalus nodded. The eyes of Nightstalker. I take it she knows about that now? Dad asked. I nodded. Yeah, I found out in Mom's orbs. Well, at least she was able to tell you. I've been trying to think of how to bring it up to you ever since you've been looking into his past. Dad chuckled. Stardust chuckled to himself. Too bad she doesn't have green eyes. It would have gone well with her coat and mane. I just rolled my eyes, saying, Anyway, who's next? Oricala smiled. I'm not sure what I'll be able to do once this is all over, but I'm hoping that I can find a way to fix what I've done to myself. I'd like to get my real body back, and maybe settle down with some pony. Dad laughed. No, Oricalus. I always thought your magic was your only love. My dad smiled, saying, Once you've been stuck as a shadow for so many years, that novelty wears off. Weren't you seeing some mare a few months before Shadow was hurt? Dad asked. My uncle shrugged. I wouldn't say seeing Scarlet, per se, but, well, let's just say that we had a lot of fun. You, I don't need to hear this, I said, closing my eyes and making gagging noises. My dad and uncle both laughed. When they finished, Wind Thrasher said, I'd like to try and help ponies when this is all over. You help ponies now, Wind Thrasher, I said. I know that, she said, blushing. What I mean is, I like to help ponies who have been through a lot of pain and stress in their lives get past the trauma they've experienced. You mean you want to be a shrink? Stardust asked. I could see you doing that. You already help us out when you're feeling down. It's called a psychologist, dumbass, Aura said. I know, I'm not that stupid. I just prefer shrink, Stardust said, sticking his tongue out of Dora. You're such a fool, Aura replied with a sigh. Okay then, what about you? What do you have planned? Stardust asked. Easy. I want a nice home for Shadow and I to grow old in, Aura said simply. You already know that, though. So I'll go with a happy memory. For me, it was the day that Tonto first told me about the lover's souls. I didn't know why, but that day I sat in his cave with him, telling me about the two griffins who loved each other so much that they swore to each other to find each other in every life and then on. It was a beautiful story, if not a little sad at the end. 
I think I read that in something of his, I said. But it was a griffin and a pony. Odd. He always said it was two griffins. Though I could see him changing the story a bit to fit Red Talon Law. Aura said. Apart from you two, I've never heard of a griffin and a pony being together, Stardust said. Dad looked over at him. It's not as uncommon as you think. Well, it didn't used to be. There were a lot of stories over the centuries of griffins and ponies being in love. Our races have worked together a lot since Equestria was first started. The most famous griffin and pony lovers were rumored to be the first children of the night, before Luna was Nightmare Moon. You mean that the first children of the night had a griffin and two? I asked. Dad nodded. Yeah, he joined to be close to the mare that he loved. It's a sad story, but also very sweet. I'd like to hear it sometime, I said with a smile. Dad smiled as well. When this is all finished, I'll tell you all I know. I forced a smile. Okay. Stardust gave a smug grin. Well, when this is all over, I plan on finding my family. I want to know who my parents are and see if I have more family. Then I'm going to find a nice mare to settle down with one day and have a foal or two. As he spoke, Windthrasher blushed, saying quietly, I think you'd be a great dad, Stardust. Aura started to laugh. Yeah, because he's a big foal himself. We all started laughing then. Stardust, on the other hoof, said, Thank you, Star Windthrasher. I happen to agree with you. I would be an awesome dad. As the laughter died down, Aura poked me, saying, What about you, Shadow? I frowned and looked down on my hooves. I'm not sure what I want to do when this is all over. Come on, there has to be something you want to do, Stardust said. Honestly, I've never thought about it. I'll just be happy to have all my family and friends around me for the rest of my life. I'd like more days like this, where we can just sit down, talk, laugh, and enjoy each other's company. I said. They all looked at me with smiles on their faces. Finally, Dad said, I think that's a great vision for the future, sweetheart. Aura hugged me tighter. A very good idea. After we talked a little more, Dad said, Grim should have been here by now. Orikala added, I agree. Maybe we should go see if we can find her. She's never been great with direction. I'll go with you, Orikalos, Dad said, getting to his hooves. No, I'll be fine. Just relax, Orikalos said, his body turning into shadows. I won't be long. As he vanished into the night, Aura whispered in my ear, Shadow, think we have a little time to slip away? I looked around at Stardust, Windthrasher, and Dad, then whispered back, Maybe, if we can get our friends to ignore us. As we spoke, I saw Windthrasher's ears perked up. She looked over at us for a moment, then winked. She raised her voice, saying, So Nightshade, what's it like living up in Stratus? Stardust and I have never been above the clouds before. That's right. Oh, you have no idea how beautiful of a city Stratus is. It's one of the biggest sky cities in the Enclave, Dad said, looking over at Windthrasher. Or I got up and slowly started to walk away towards where we parked the sky carriage. It was tucked back into a small patch of trees to keep it out of sight from any pegasus or griffins flying over. As we started to sneak away, Stardust moved his head to see where we were going. Then Windthrasher pulled his attention away from us by saying, Wouldn't it be amazing to see it sometime, Stardust? Oh, yeah. I wanted to see it ever since I left my stable. Stardust replied. Aura and I were clear. She led me into the sky carriage, and once we were in, the... She shut the door and pulled me close, kissing me hard and pinning me against the far wall. Before I knew it, my duster and saddlebags were off. I pushed myself against her, taking in every kiss as if it was the last one I'd get. Our lovemaking was better than I'd ever seen it before. I needed this more than I think or I could ever know. It started to out fast and hot, full of passion and need. Our bodies sweaty, heat filling the sky carriage and the windows fogging up. Then it turned into something slower. I explored my lover's body like I never had before, finding every spot that could make her moan, every place that could make her laugh, and the places that made her shiver. Aura was a wonder to me, a creature that was so different, yet she felt like I knew every part of her at the same time. I took in every sound she made, every movement on her body, every twitch of her talons, paws, or wings. Then, when she couldn't take it anymore, she twisted on me and started doing the same to me. 
She didn't have to ask me, like I liked something or not. My body was hers to do with as she wanted. I am hers and she's mine. It was an understanding that went beyond words, beyond our bodies, beyond everything. It was like deep down my soul had been waiting for this griffin to fly into my life, and now that she was here, I'd never wanted to let her go. That realization was the most wonderful thing, I, and the most worst. Why couldn't I have had this for longer? It was so unfair. She was my soulmate, and I've only had the last two weeks to have her to myself. If I would have known what was going to happen when I first met her, I would have told her my feelings so long ago. The sad truth is that nothing can change what happened in the past, and nothing can change what's going to happen next. Finally, when we both get were spent, that we could barely move, we both lay together on the messy sky carriage. Aura chuckled a little, saying, Stardust is going to kill us if we don't clean this thing before we leave. I nuzzled into her chest. Let him get mad. It was worth it. She yawned. I agree. Maybe soon we'll be able to do this whenever we want. Yeah, maybe, I said. She yawned again. You really wore me out. Did you miss me that much while you were stuck in that hole? You have no idea, I said. Well, I'm here now. We're both safe and happy. Soon you'll be rid of that monster inside of you and we can get on with our lives, she said, closing her eyes. It took me a moment to respond as my head throbbed again, like it's been doing for hours now. Yeah. I love you, she said, her voice fading. I felt tears in my eyes as I heard her start to snore lightly. I love you more than you'll ever know. I waited a little while until I knew Aura was fast asleep. When I knew she wouldn't wake, I slowly pulled myself out from under her talon and made my way over my saddlebags. I pulled out a piece of paper and a pen I wanted to leave her a note, telling her what I had to do and begged her for to give me. Then I remembered the note I left her the last time, back when Envy forced me to go to Halo 1. No matter what I said in the letter, she'd never forgive me for it. So I wrote the only thing that really mattered. Aura, you're the best things that happened to me in my short life. There are no words that can explain what I had to do or why. I know that you can't forgive me for this. But this is all that's left for me. Tell the others I'm sorry, especially Windthrasher. She's just going to be as hurt as you because I told her I'd warn you all if Aquila was close to breaking out. I told you all that I had a few days left before she took over, but I lied. I know I do that a lot, and I should have said something sooner, but there's nothing I can do. There's nothing any of you can do. If I told you that my last option was, then you'd try to stop me. I understand. But please try and see that I'm doing this to save the Wasteland. Don't blame yourself or any pony else. It was my choice. One of the few I've had in my life. I love you. Your soulmate, Shadowstar. Once I was done, I put the note down next to my saddlebags. I pulled out the plasma rifle, Misery, Dreamwalker, and my shotgun, and the revolver I found in Mill City Tower. I sent them next to my barding and duster. I only took the revolver. Once that was finished, I pushed the door open and started to sneak down the pathway that led back to my friends and dad. When I was closer, I saw that all three of them were laughing around the fire, still waiting for our callus to get back with Mom. Keeping low, I snuck past them. I started searching my way down the path that went to a small valley that led west. My head throbbed again, bringing tears to my eyes, but I kept on walking. I wanted to be as far away from my friends as I could. I had no guarantee that Aura wouldn't wake up soon, find my note, and start looking for me. I couldn't let her find me. Not before I was finished. She was going to hate me for this. She would blame herself, even though nothing could have been done. That's just how the Wasteland works. I was just playing my part. Once I knew I was far enough away, I sat on the cold, dry, hard ground, and looked up at the cold night sky. A little of the moon's light poked into the sky's cloud layer. The small beam of blue light seemed to fall on me and illuminate the small spot that I sat on in a bluish-white. I closed my eyes for a moment and said softly, Luna, if you're there, please forgive me for what I have to do. I opened my eyes again, then looked down at the only thing I brought with me, the revolver from Mill City Tower. I checked the cylinder and saw that it was still loaded. 
I closed it up and spun the cylinder quickly. I took in a few deep breaths as a single tear fell from my right eye. Mom said it herself. There's only one choice left to me now. A choice deep down I knew was coming. I tried to fight it, tried to fix myself, hoping that it wouldn't come to pass, but deep down I always knew. Even if Mom had a way to help me now, there wasn't enough time. Even though I tried to fool myself that there was. I lifted the muzzle revolver in my magic. It made my head swim as I felt more of Aquila's power flow through me. I ignored it. In a moment, it wouldn't matter anymore. I brought the revolver up under my chin and angled it so the bullet wouldn't miss. I pulled back on the hammer, closed my eyes, ignoring the rising anger from deep in my mind, ignoring the scream from Aquila as I used the last of my strength to pull the trigger. The hammer snapped down. Bang. No. No. No, 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 no. It felt like some pony just jabbed a spike into my right ear as my magic pulled the gun out of the way at the last second. The blast going off to the right, next to my face. I could feel the hot line of my cheek where the bullet grazed me and my ear was ringing. Did I chicken out? No. I wasn't the one who moved the revolver at the last second. My magic wasn't under my control anymore. I could feel it now. Through the pain in my ear and face, she was there. You fool! Do you really think I was going to let you just kill yourself when I'm this close? I'm done with this game, Shadow Star. It's time to pay. Your bill is due. Game over! Aquila said. No. Please, no. I yelled as my magic blasted out of my horn, turning the darkness around us red. My body felt as if millions of tiny needles were stabbing into it as more and more magic built up inside of me. I would have given you the rest of tomorrow to prepare for this, to say goodbye to your friends, but no! You just had to go and do something so fucking stupid. I wanted another day, anyway, to make sure I had the power I needed. But you forced my hoof. In two minutes, your body is mine, and you'll fade from this world forever. Aquila said from inside my head. My body started to rise into the air, just like when it did when Aquila first joined with me ten years ago. I started to cry as more pain ran through my body. As I lifted higher into the air, I screamed, Aquila, just leave my friends alone, please. Do whatever else you want, but please don't hurt them. Fuck your friends, fuck your family, and fuck you, Shadow. If you would have just given me what you promised ten years ago, like I told you, then we wouldn't be here. I would have left them alone. But now, I want you to fade into nothing, knowing that every pony you love is going to die. Aquila said with a wicked laugh. I won't let you, I shouted. How are you going to stop me? She taunted. You have no magic left. Your mother's gone. You killed the only other mare who could stop it. And you wasted what little time you had left to sleep with that griffin. Then the sound that made my heart stop echoed towards me. Shadow! My head snapped towards Aura, Stardust, Windthrasher, Dad, or Ecalus, and Mom, who were standing a safe distance away, looking up at me with horror. I started to scream. Get away from me. Shadow, no, we can help you. Mom yelled up at me. We aren't leaving you behind. Control her. I know you can. Mora yelled. I felt tears run down my face as Aquila started to laugh again. Perfect. Now I don't have to hunt them down. Please run. She's close. She's going to kill all of you. Get as far away from her as you can. I yelled louder, then screamed as pain lanced through my body. One minute left. Aquila chuckled. Oricalus looked at me with horror in his purple eyes. And then he said, She's right. I can feel her. We have to get as far away as we can. Aura glared at him. I'm not leaving her like this. Then she looked over at Mom and said, Grim, do something. I... I can't anymore. She's too far gone. Aquila has taken over her body in magic. Soon Shadow will be gone and only the monster will be left. Mom said, taking a step back. Start of sighs meant mine, and then he said, Shadow, what can we do? I looked down at them, then remembered something. Dad, use Demon Slayer, it can kill her. He looked sick at the thought. Shadow, that'll kill you too. I don't care. You have to, or she'll destroy everything. Do it for the wasteland. 
I screamed. He pulled Demon Slayer out quickly and aimed it at me. I don't want to hurt you, sweetheart. Thirty seconds, <laughs> Aquila said with a crazed laugh. Tears were running down his face as he said, I'm sorry, my little star. He fired, but Aquila just used my magic to stop the bullet in midair. Then she took hold of my father and slammed him into the ground. No, don't hurt them, please, I yelled. Twenty seconds, <laughs> was all Aquila said. The magic coming out of me grew stronger, and I swore that I could hear the ground under me rumble. My eyes found Windthrasher. Please run. I don't want you to die because of me. Please. Windthrasher nodded and yelled. We have to run. She's right. We can't do anything right now. Aquila will kill us when she has full control. But we can't, Aura started to say. Oricalus cut her off. She's right. We have to live to fight another day. All of you get as far away from here as you can. Stardust nodded and said, We love you, Shadow. We'll find a way. We will. Then he flew off with Windthrasher, Mom jumping onto my friend's back as we flew off. Ten, Aquila said with a purr. Aura looked up at me. I love you, Shadow. I'll get you back. Have faith and fight it. I felt tears fall from my face. I love you too. Nine. Don't you dare let her win! You hear me? Don't let her win! Aura said as she took to the air and followed my friends. Eight. Aquila said in delight. Uncle Ori, go! Seven. I could feel the power grow even stronger. No. I gave my word that I would protect you till the end. He said as his body turned to shadow. Six, Aquila said. Please, Uncle Ori, I can't lose you because of this monster. I cried. Five! He smiled as his body floated towards me. I will always be with you, Shadar. Always. Four! You'll die! I yelled in agony. Maybe, Ori Kellis said as his... Shadow closed around me. But we'll go together. Two! Aquila shouted in my head. I felt so much love coming off my uncle then, and I cried harder. I love you, Uncle Ori. Me too, he said as Aquila laughed in my head. Then, as the last words from the monster inside me were said, his shadow slammed in my own. <laughs> One! She yelled in euphoric glee. Footnote. Game over. No perk added. Thank you for playing. Aquila wins. Shadow Star loses. <laughs>